What roles do King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Ancient Babylon, and Donald Trump, 45th President of the United States, play in God furthering his kingdom? Find out on today's episode of A View from the Wall. Join I Am A Watchman Ministries Managing Editor Joe Kerr with co-host Dylan Burroughs, bringing you a fascinating discussion regarding the importance of Bible prophecy and Christian living today as it relates to our responsibility as believers to be watchmen. This is A View From The Wall. Welcome to A View From The Wall. I'm Dylan Bros here with co-host Joseph Kerr to discuss a topic that has intrigued many regarding the role of Bible prophecy in our culture. Daniel 2.21 tells us it is God who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. Author Wallace Henley's latest book, Two Men from Babylon, has research that could apply to today's leaders and what we can learn from this important information. Henley served as a White House aide during the Nixon administration and went on to become an award-winning journalist for the Birmingham News in Alabama. He is the author of more than 20 books, including God and Churchill with Jonathan Sandus, Winston Churchill's great-grandson, and his latest book, Two Men from Babylon. Wallace, welcome to A View from the Wall. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Well, we appreciate you joining us today, and we love your new book. You document how God uses Nebuchadnezzar, king of ancient Babylon, in significant ways in the book of Daniel. But for our listeners who may not be familiar with the story from the Bible, take a short version of that and share it with those who are listening to see how we can find some parallels in leadership in our nation today. Babylon was the most dominant empire in the world in its time. It went off to Judah. And it took some young men uh, from Judah and brought them to Babylon as exiles. And those young men had to face immediately the challenges of adopting to the Babylonian worldview, the political correctness of Babylon. We see now in our time that there are dominant societies. Uh, The United States certainly has been one of those. New York is the center uh, in the minds of many people from overseas. But Babylon really is the world system attempting to organize itself against God, without God, and in defiance of God. Well, as you say that God uses unlikely leaders to bring about his plans and purposes, and we've seen a number of those examples throughout history, but what are some specific figures that are examples of God using unlikely heroes? Well, of course, I think immediately about Abraham Lincoln. People considered him to be completely unelectable. He was a country bumpkin. He came out of poverty. Uh, He seemed to be a failure in everything that he had put his hand to, and yet God raised him up at at a critical time in the life of this nation. Calvin Coolidge was such a no one that one person wrote and said, don't worry, if you you just give him time, uh, you'll find out that he really does have some intelligence, that he really can speak. Um, I think about Grant. I think about uh, a few others. One was called uh, his accidency because of his Uh, the unlikelihood of his election. God raises up leaders in the context of his great kingdom mission. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all of the world as a witness to all of the ethnes, all the people groups. And then the end, the telos in Greek, which means purpose, the purpose of everything will come. And so the whole point of history is the advance of God's kingdom message. Leaders, are important because nations are important in the plan of God. And I was just looking at this recently in Romans 13 that talks about how God establishes government. And you discuss how governments and seats of power and influence are also centers of concentrated spiritual warfare. We want to take a moment and talk about that. Share, if you would, about the role between spiritual warfare and the human governments in our world today. Yes, power is the fundamental temptation. When Lucifer was tempting Eve and then Adam. He said, in in essence, take power over your life. Has God really said, don't eat that fruit? You take the power. Power gives tremendous ground to the powers of darkness, if you will. So I have a chapter in the book entitled The Clustering of Demons, uh, because the White House, the, the, the Oval Office, is the most powerful location on the planet. Now, there's a difference between authority and power. Authority is handed from the higher to the lower to those who are under authority. So when the civil ruler is under authority, proper authority, 
then that civil ruler has a legitimate claim on its society. But when that ruler comes out from under the authority of God, as expressed in the scriptures and lived out by the Lord Jesus Christ, then that ruler is seizing power and is going to dominate a society in a way that God would not want it. Well, it's interesting that you talk about it that way. You refer to the example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the Old Testament. We look at the New Testament, and there's John the Baptist who speaks God's truth to authority, and we see the persecution he goes through for that. Talk a little bit about some of the uh, consequences that come when we do confront authority with the truth today. I think about Amos the prophet, and God had, had assigned him to go in and speak uh, God's word in the uh, presence of, of the king. And there was a court priest who was determined that Amos was going to speak, but he was not going to speak anything except what he was permitted to speak. But Amos said, I will prophesy at the house of God. He will speak that. Now, when we take that stance as the church to, to speak in our prophetic role, when we take that stance, we have to be prepared for the consequence of that, which may be persecution. Um, it may be disenfranchisement. Uh, there will be any number of things that the power structures will attempt to do to silence the voice of the prophet. But the prophet is obligated to speak and will not serve God or the culture unless it speaks prophetically from the position of God, not from a uh, political standpoint, but from the position of God. And by that, I mean not from a partisan standpoint. There's only one partisanship of the kingdom person, and that's the kingdom. Well, that's a good way to put it. I know that in Jeremiah, he talks about how the truth was like fire in his bones. He couldn't hold it in when he tried to. And you sense that in reading your book, that there's this message that has to get out. And when we talk about two men from Babylon and people looking at that, what is the main message you want people to take away from that? I want people to see that God is active in history for the sake of his kingdom and that God is in charge of who sits in the places of power, either by his intentional will or his permissive will. Oh, that's such a good way to put it. And when we return, we'll discuss spiritual warfare in more detail and what's happening in our own government and governments around the world. So stick with us as we continue talking with Wallace Henry here on A View from the Wall. From I Am A Watchman Ministries, here's today's I Am A Watchman Minute. Can apparent contradictions in Scripture be resolved? Yes. Here's two examples. 1 Samuel 14 notes that Absalom had three sons, but 2 Samuel 18 notes that he did not have any sons to continue his lineage. Is this an error? No. Absalom did have three sons, but they all died very young. Number two, the Gospels note that Jesus was crucified at two different times, the third hour and the sixth hour. But that's because two different systems of keeping time, Roman and Hebrew, were referenced. There are apparent contradictions in Scripture. However, all can be resolved with a little research. I encourage you to take advantage of free I'm a Watchman resources so you can grow in knowledge and confidence in the Word of God. Be bold. Be faithful. Be a Watchman. I am a Watchman.com. Welcome back to A View from the Wall. This is Dylan and Joe, and we've been talking with Wallace Henley in his new book, Two Men from Babylon. And really at the heart of this book is this concept of spiritual battle and how God works throughout time and history to accomplish his purposes. When we were in our last segment, we talked about spiritual battle and how it applies today. And we talked a little bit as well about Daniel 2.21, this idea that it is God who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. Talk a little bit more about that idea and how it applies in our culture here in America today? Well, we're moving God's great cosmic plan for the nations and for the world is to move from paradise to paradise. The Bible begins, the world begins in paradise, the Garden of Eden. There's a loss of that paradise when indeed we human beings attempt to take the power away from God and make our own decisions in defiance of his will. He wants us to make our own decisions, but not in defiance of his will. This is what happens in the Garden of Eden. It results in the loss of paradise. 
And then at the end of time, the Bible tells us the new Jerusalem is coming. Well, we live between those two, paradise one and paradise two. And in the midst of our living in there, there's always the pull toward chaos. The, 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 the enemy, the powers of darkness are always fragmenting. They're always trying to pull us down into increasing disunity um, and a lack of coherence. They work at this all the time. God gives the gift of government to restrain lawlessness. But when l- government steps out from under the authority of God, it becomes uh, a, a tool in the hands of the powers of darkness. And this is what the powers of darkness seek all the time. I ha- there's a very, very prominent person. I will not name that individual. But after I left the White House, and he had been frequently in the White House, we were one day having a telephone conversation and he said to me, Wallace, you know, every time I go in there, I feel this, I feel this darkness. I feel this oppressive uh, spirit in there. Well, I had begun to feel that too. When I first went to the White House, uh, theologically, I had drifted into uh, theological liberalism. Uh, I was faithful to my wife. I, I was not immoral, all those kinds of things. And yet I just wasn't sure what I believed. Well, I've started attending a prayer breakfast in the, in the West Wing. Uh, for members of the White House staff, informal prayer breakfast on Thursday mornings, and just was reignited uh, with the Lord. And and as that came on, if you will, as that spiritual side of me awakened, I began to sense uh, the presence that was not a good presence um, in that place. And this happens at all points of power, whether it's a country or whether it's a company or a family or a church. All power is going to come under that kind of temptation. So this should tell us that one of our greatest responsibilities is to pray for the president. And if, God forbid, Joe Biden becomes president, we need to continue praying for him, too. We need to pray for the president. And we need to pray that there would be eyes open to what is happening spiritually in the attack on on places of power. You know, it's interesting, and you mentioned it in the book, that some of the central figures of history, and you wrote about Churchill and several others, Golda Meir, several people throughout history that we could name as examples, and in America, um, Lincoln specifically, President Kennedy, Reagan, all seem to have a sense of their role in that spiritual battle and talked about it. Interestingly, several of them had attempts on their life. Talk about those people. Do you think some of those leaders really have a sense of their role in God's plan in history? Yes. In fact, one of the most uh, striking stories is between Reagan and Pope John Paul XXIII. Both of them were instrumental in the fall of communism. And both of them realized that they were used of God in that purpose and that their lives, both of them, had come under attack, uh, attempted assassinations, and they both recognized that God preserved their lives through that And they came to believe that it was for the purpose of of bringing down communism. In the case of Richard Nixon, there were those who would say that Nixon was preserved uh, so that he could preserve Israel when it came under attack, Yom Kippur, 1973. And the Israelis, I remember meeting with consul uh, representation, and the Israelis were saying, we're going to be pushed into the sea because they had no weapons at that point. And they were very concerned that they, they applied to the United States. For armaments, there was a law that restricted what we could do. Nixon uh, reversed that and delivered Israel at that point. Some, some would say that God raised him up for that purpose. So all across history, there have been people who've had that sense. But I need to talk about another aspect of this, and that is when I left the White House in 1973, uh, that next year I wrote a little book entitled The White House Mystique. It's one of the forgotten books of history. But I could not help but think about that from the perspective of a junior aide and the mystique of the White House, the way the power um, overcomes you and and robs you almost of the ability to think critically when you're in that environment. I would take people over to the Oval Office when the president was not in town, and I would show them the Oval Office. There would be a velvet rope across the door. And I've seen people uh, stand there as if they were having a moment before the Holy of Holies itself. I remember one case where there was just this very um, light chatter and laughing all the way across as we walked through the corridors uh, to the Oval Office. And But when that, when that person got to the Oval Office, 
all that chatter turned almost to tears and weeping. So if you find yourself all of a sudden, as Donald Trump did, and as others have, if you all of a sudden find yourself as occupying that office, the sense of it, the, the mystique of it is just about overwhelming. And it's, it's shocking when you first walk in there, even as an aide, when you first walk in there, the, the sense of that power, that mystical sense inside that place. Well, that's important to point out because for so many people, they don't think about it in terms of power and of spiritual warfare and the battles that go on. One thing you point out in your book is that although Trump is an imperfect person, he's perfect for this moment in our culture. Talk about that for just a moment before we go to break here. Well, God, God works with all kinds of people. And the Bible says, I love Isaiah 35, that talks about the fact that God dwells in the highest place, but on earth with the lowest of people, with the lowest of men and women. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where he says he's chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And so we see God doing this. We saw it in Lincoln. We saw it surprisingly in George Washington. George Washington never anticipated being in the role he was in. And, and people laughed at it in his day. So this is the way God works. So these people are not righteous people. They're not good people. But they're people under the sovereignty of God that will be used for purpose. And Trump and all this toughness and all this coarseness, in one sense, is some would say he's a judgment on our nation uh, with, with the kind of speech he uses and the kinds of attitudes he conveys while, while he's a reflection of what our culture has become. Others, of course, would see him in a very positive sense as being tough and able to stand up under the tremendous assaults that are brought against him all the time. God is in charge. That's the point of two men from Babylon. God is in charge. Nebuchadnezzar was a crazy guy. He wound up in the wilderness. He was there for seven years, eating like cows and, and wandering around eating grass. Uh, and then he comes to this wonderful moment of confession where he says, the God of Daniel is the true God. And I pray that we will hear a powerful confession coming from the lips of Donald Trump in days ahead. Well, I'm enjoying this conversation about two men from Babylon with Wallace Henley. And when we return, we'll talk more here on A View from the Wall. Stick with us. The Bible predicts the rapture of the church is coming. Are you ready? Soon many will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Only they will escape the dark days that are coming. A time of tribulation that will usher in the Antichrist and great destruction upon the entire earth. There's only one escape, one way, one light, one truth. His name is Jesus. He came and died so that we may live forever with Him. But to receive this new life, there are three things we must do. The ABCs of salvation. A. Admit you're a sinner and that you need a Savior. Ask for forgiveness and receive His grace. B. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He came, lived, died, rose again, and will come again. Believe that He is Lord and God. C. Commit to walk His path, the path He wants you to walk, and walk it out by faith. Then you'll be ready for the return of the Lord. To learn more about the rapture and how to know for sure, visit amiraptureready.org. Welcome back to A View from the Wall. This is Dylan and Joe, and we've been talking with Wallace Henley, the author of Two Men from Babylon, and I'm so glad that you're with us today. It's such an important time in our culture as we come close to the time of year where we will be casting our vote for who is the president as well as for many other elected official offices. As we look at two men from Babylon, there's a quote in there from Rob Chernow who famously said that God seems to show a keen interest in North American politics and while you might be you know, a little biased in that regard, is there evidence that God has used America in some special way to change the course of world events since its founding? You know, I left, I left the White House after three years in 1973 with the conviction that the church is the most important in these days, most essential, to use the terminology of our time, um, organism in the whole of the world. Because everything a nation is, is at the core of its belief system and worldview. And that was the worldview that created this marvelous democracy that became so prosperous 
and charged with freedoms. The United States, I believe, its mission in history was to give freedom for the church and prosperity for the church to carry out the mission stated in Jesus' prophecy. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all of the world as a witness to all of the people, all the nations, and then the end, the telos, the purpose will come. So God gave us remarkable liberties so the church would have the liberty to proclaim the gospel. God blessed this nation with prosperity so that the church would have the finances, the material means of taking the gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. And when the church is faithful to that, the nation is blessed. It really does ride on the church. The health of the nation is in direct proportion to the health of the church in the nation. And this has made, I think, this has helped to form the idea of exceptionalism. It's not that God ignores other nations. He does not. But he had this special mission for America tied back to Matthew 24, 14. And Matthew 24, 14 is the whole purpose of human history. That's that's what is happening. The kingdom of God is righteousness, justice, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. This is the kingdom that God wants to take over this world, a kingdom where there's nothing but righteousness and goodness and peace and spirit-given joy. That's what I live for, and that's what I hope the church will live for, and that God will even cause those in power to see the unique privilege they have of leading a nation that has such a mission in its history. Well, I'm so glad that you said that because in your book, one of my favorite parts is chapter 11 that's called Healthy Church, Healthy Nation. And you even go into a little bit of detail about the messages to the seven churches. Do you have some insights for our listeners about God's messages to the seven churches and how they would apply to us today? Yes, indeed. Every one of those churches was dysfunctional in some way. Smyrna was in best, the best shape of, I think, all of them. Uh, and it was the smallest of the churches, but all of them were given the charge. Every time the Lord would speak to them, the charge would be not to forget the gospel and the mission of the church and the recognition of the presence of the Lord in the midst of the church, because that's that's the nation, if you will, that has the, the, the responsibility, the core responsibility of the gospel of the kingdom. But look, that is what blessed America at the very beginning. Before our founders sat down to develop the constitutional system. Before that, long before that, we had the two great awakenings in which there was a call back to principles that had been laid down as early as 1630 when it was declared that this would be as a city on a hill. And because of that declaration, there was the sense of us entering into covenant with God. And that covenant was renewed in the time of the great awakenings. They proceed the time of the structuring of the nation, then the nation is structured with the freedoms, the opportunities. We've had rare freedoms and rare opportunities. And there are many, many of us who are older. Uh, I'm 79 on my next birthday. There are many of us who are older who can see these freedoms being ripped away from us. And we're very concerned about that, especially freedom for the gospel to be propagated even in and through our institutions so that we could be a city on a hill that would signal something of the blessings that comes to a nation that gives itself in covenant to the living God and his purposes. We discuss Bible prophecy a lot on this program, Mr. Henley, and we like to conclude each program with a word of encouragement and challenge to our watchmen and women, those who see themselves as watchmen on the wall, watching, warning, witnessing, and seeking to finish well in these last days. Speak directly to that group for a minute. And I would say that God is also watching the watchmen, watchwomen on the wall. Just as he told Solomon when the temple was built in Jerusalem, God said, my eyes will be on this place. My ears will be open to this place. My focus, my attention. The church, in many ways, is the successor to the Old Testament temple. And consequently, God's eyes, are on the prayers of his people. God's eyes are on what is said, what is preached, what is proclaimed, what rises up in worship in and through the church. God's eyes are fixed there. It's like the House of Representatives. I worked for a while in the the United States Congress, and occasionally 
uh, I was able to go on the floor during floor boats. And the first time I watched that happen, I thought, this is intercessory prayer. Because what happened, every representative was elected to represent the interest of his or her district in the United States House of Representatives. And when they voted, they voted the interest of their people. It is as if God has said, my eyes are going to be on my church. They're going to be my representatives. And the way they vote is the way the nation is going to flourish or not flourish. Because my eyes are upon them. They have the vote. So I want to encourage the watchmen on the wall, those who are very carefully seeking to hear God, that he is eating you, seeing you as a representative of the kingdom of heaven in the outpost of this world. Those are such powerful words. And scripture also talks about us being ambassadors for Christ. We represent him wherever we go and whatever we do. So we hope you're encouraged and challenged by today's message from Wallace Henley, author of Two Men from Babylon. It's from Thomas Nelson Publishing. You can pick up a copy of it at our website, IamAWatchman.com or wherever books are sold. Thanks for being with us here on A View from the Wall. Join us next time. A View from the Wall, in association with I Am a Watchman Ministries, exists to equip a worldwide audience with biblical truth, sharing it with others, and being prepared for Christ's imminent return. The team seeks to encourage, inspire, and equip watchmen for such a time as this. For information about the ministry and upcoming events, visit IamAWatchman.com. A View from the Wall is made possible by the team of dedicated pastors, editors, and the many contributors of I Am A Watchman Ministries. To support our efforts, give online at IamAWatchman.com and click on the Donate button. Thanks for listening, and join us again next time on A View from the Wall.